Today I would like to share an interesting mathematics problem with a very satisfying result. My hope for this video is that mathematicians of all abilities can take something away about problem solving approaches. So stick around, the visuals should help guide you through this journey even if you're not familiar with all the high level math being presented. We will begin by drawing the function that we care about, which in this case is y equals 1 over x. I will emphasize that if you are unfamiliar with this graph, don't sweat it. Just watch the colorful visuals on screen. We'll get to the actual problem shortly. The problem is about this graph, specifically in the first quadrant. That is, all the positive numbers and none of the negative numbers. Along the x-axis, we will need a vertical line. We will call the x value of this line x0. But notice that the actual value of x0 is not important, so long as it is greater than 0. We also need a line above x1, which similarly can be any number as long as it's greater than or equal to x0. We are going to focus on the area that is created by these bounds, on the left by x0 and on the right by x1, on the bottom by the x-axis, or y equals 0, and on the top by our function y equals 1 over x. We are almost done setting up the problem. We just need a way to calculate this area. If you're comfortable with calculus, you might already see a way to do so. If not, enjoy the animations and just trust the process. This area can be calculated as the integral of 1 over x from the bounds x0 to x1. The antiderivative of 1 over x is the natural log of x. We can then evaluate this at the limits of integration, giving the natural log of x1 minus the natural log of x0. We can take x1 to the extreme, making it as large as we want. As such, this area can now be represented as the limit as x1 goes to infinity. Since natural log is unbounded, the limit will equal infinity. Notice that subtracting natural log of x0 is subtracting a finite value from an infinite one meaning that the limit will still be infinite. This also means that no matter where x0 is, as long as it is a positive real number, this area will be infinite. We can now do practically the same thing to x0, taking the limit as it goes to zero. Since the natural log of zero approaches negative infinity, and since subtracting a negative is the equivalent of adding, we likewise conclude that this area is infinite. And similarly, we can move x1 around and the area will always be infinite for any x1 greater than zero. I will claim that it is clear, then, that if we expand both x0 and x1 to their relative extremes, we end up with an infinite area. Moreover, this area is infinite on both the left and the right. This naturally brings up a question. Is there a way we can split this area perfectly in half? Is there a vertical line we can draw at some value, x equals q, such that the area to the left of q and the area to the right of q are equal. To make this more clear, we have an area to the left which we'll call AL, and an area to the right which we'll call AR. AL is equal to infinity, and AR is equal to infinity. However, are they equal to each other? Even though both areas are infinite, we have to be careful about determining their relative size. Without getting into too much detail, I will make the claim that the areas are not necessarily equal. I will also claim that there does exist some value for q such that these two areas are equal. The question we want to answer is, what value does q have to be such that the area to the left is equal to the area to the right? To take a phrase from 3 blue 1 brown, now is a good time to pause and ponder. If you believe you have the tools to solve this problem, I welcome you to. I will be presenting one solution during the rest of this video. However, I have seen at least two other ways of finding the answer. If you solve it in a different way, please let me know how. I'd be very curious to see all the different thought processes that lead to different solutions to this question.
To begin our solution, let's establish some symmetry. This is the line y equals x, which perfectly divides the Cartesian plane in half diagonally. The reason this is so helpful is because the graph y equals 1 over x is itself reflectively symmetric about y equals x. For a more technical description, this means 1 over x is its own inverse function, a special property. For a visual description, all this means is that the graph does the same thing up and to the left of this new green line as it does going down and to the right. Critically, this means that the area we are focusing on, the area under the curve y equals 1 over x, is split perfectly in half by the line y equals x. Therefore, the area up and to the left, which we'll call a 1, must be equal to the area down and to the right, which we'll call a 2. These are both infinite areas, but they must be equal due to the symmetry. Note that the point of intersection, where these two lines cross, is at 1, 1. This is because 1 is the only positive number that when divided by 1 is itself. That is, 1 divided by 1 is equal to 1. Remember that, it will be important. We can now bring back our line x equals q and investigate where exactly it must be to make the areas on either side of it equal. I will claim that q is clearly less than 1, since any value 1 or greater would result in the left area being larger than the right area. We now have four distinct sections. We know that everything up and to the left of the green line is equal to everything down and to the right of the green line. We want everything on the left of the purple line to be equal to the area to the right of the purple line. Notice that there are only two small slices of area that trade hands, if you will. This triangle, and this strange shape here. Since these are the only two areas that swap sides, for the left and right areas to be equal in total, these two small orange areas must also be equal. If we can find the Q value that makes these orange areas equal, we will have found the value we're looking for. First, let's find the area of this triangle. We'll call it AT. Since the left side of this triangle is defined by the origin, and the right side of this triangle is defined by x equals q, we know that q is the base. We also know that the height of the triangle must be q, since the height is defined by the function y equals x, so the height must have the same value as the base. The formula for area of a triangle is base times height divided by 2. We can rewrite this as q squared over 2. We will set this result to the side for later. Now let's see if we can calculate the strange area. We'll call it AS. The left bound of AS is defined by x equals q. The right bound is defined by the intersection point of x and 1 over x, which if you remember is at x equals 1. We also know the top and bottom bounds of AS. The bottom is defined by the line y equals x, and the top is defined by the curve y equals 1 over x. This means we can find the area with an integral. The strange area is equal to the integral of 1 over x minus x from q to 1. Both of these terms have well-known antiderivatives, which we can take. We can then evaluate the antiderivative at the bounds x equals 1 and x equals q. And then we can go on algebra autopilot, keeping in mind that the natural log of 1 equals 0, and that subtracting a negative gives a positive, we eventually arrive at as is equal to q squared over 2 minus the natural log of q minus 1 half. We're almost done. We can now set these two values, at and as, equal to each other, which gives us this mess. Notice that we can subtract q squared over 2 from both sides, simplifying this problem greatly. And another algebra autopilot. Adding natural log of q to the other side, raising both sides as a power of e, thus cancelling out the natural log. Then, knowing our exponent rules, we can finally arrive at the value q is equal to 1 over the square root of e. There we have it. If we draw a vertical line at x equals 1 over the square root of e, we will perfectly cut this infinite area in half. The area to the left and the area to the right of 1 over the square root of e are equal to each other. 
I think that's a beautiful result.